Welcome everyone again. Welcome folks online. Such a treat to be here together um, and have this opportunity to keep digging in, to practice, keep building community. And last week we we just got started with Old Path, White Clouds, this beautiful book, which is the essentially kind of cobbled together stories about the historic life of the Buddha <clears throat> that was compiled by Thich Nhat Hanh. And it's just a great reminder for us to use our life as teaching, right? So this, again, I, I mentioned it last week, but it, it bears repeating that the teachings of Buddhism did not just come from <clears throat> on high. They came from very close observation of our lived experience and then applying that and resting with that, training our mind and being able to then really be available for the insights that naturally arise. So I, I love that um, opportunity that this book gives us. And this week we have a really special teaching, one of the more famous stories of the Buddha's early life it's about him sitting under the rose apple tree. Maybe some of you are familiar with it. And so we'll we'll look a bit about that story when he's about nine years old. And one thing that I really appreciate about this book, I brought it up last time, but there's such a highlighting, <clears throat> excuse me, of the themes around not only, of course, waking up to our own delusions and being able to see reality as it is, but waking up to the delusions of our society and our culture. So in the time of the Buddha, that's it's not capitalism, right? There's monarchies. But so much of the teachings is around Buddha really questioning, why do the Brahmins have all the power? Why are certain people delegated to be paid money, to give blessings, and other people have nothing? Why are we separating people into categories of who deserves and doesn't deserve? And just such a really beautiful part of how these teachings go against the stream, about how these teachings are directly connected to a sense of liberation, not only for ourselves, but liberating all the structures that we're living in. There's just no other way. And another big theme in these teachings is the connection to the natural world. As I mentioned, you know, all of the activities of the Buddha and then his followers, his bhikkhus, it's all just done like walking through the natural world, connected to the earth. And as a result, I think almost a bridge, it's also very embodied, right? A lot of these teachings are kind of directly connected to coming home into our bodies. So our meditation this evening will start really with an embodied practice more directly I think and hope always we're embodying our practices here, but this one will be a bit more deliberate. <clears throat> we're going to really look and kind of work with a sense of this, this form body. So a lot of our meditation, especially like a mindfulness of breathing will connect us to the sensations of breath in the body or a body scan will connect us to sensations in the body. That's kind of our form level. And then we'll also explore just this beautiful experience of what's called the subtle body. So the experience of the body that is one layer below that form body. That could sound a little uncertain. So if we think of what is it like in your body when you're experiencing heartbreak, loneliness, frustration, right? That's not just the sensations of the breath as the belly rises, or there's a whole other kind of field of sensations. And so we'll also attend to that subtle body. Um, here on, on Wednesday nights at the in the well of being for our friends who often come, you know, and for our friends who are maybe coming for a first time, we really, it's really important that each part of this evening is woven together with our compassionate attention and awareness. So in our practice, that's maybe the obvious place, but we'll also be engaging in discussion with one another and conversation. And it's so important that we continue to have that ground of compassionate awareness, compassionate listening, compassionate speaking, in order for us to feel you know, a deeper connection to these teachings and for them to feel embodied. We have to feel safe, that's, that's hard. I wish I could promise that everybody in this room could feel safe. I, I can't. 
but I'd like us to really engage in the conditions that can support that. And that's, again, really being aware of our, our body, our speech, our mind, the thoughts, and, and the words that we're sharing with others here. So come on in. Welcome. I was at dinner where you guys were, and I was like, uh-oh. Uh-oh. I hope they're coming. <laughs> Looks like they're still eating. So, yeah, nice you made it. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's good. Laughing, as Sokni Rinpoche told me, laughing helps open up the subtle body. So, and dancing, but we're not going to do that tonight. Sorry, maybe another night. Didn't bring the dancing shoes. So yeah, so just kind of really keeping in mind that everything we're doing here tonight is building that sense of compassionate awareness through the meditation, through the discussion, and through our engagements with other people, other beings in this room. Um, I almost never introduced myself, but I'm Eve Ekman. <laughs> and uh, one thing I really love nerding out on <clears throat> is the science of embodiment. And recently, I, I got to do a course with a beautiful teacher named Lama Willa this last weekend, who's really focusing on bringing embodiment as the center for our practices of waking up in the context of Tibetan Buddhism. And then I also have been reading, rereading one of the one of the most amazing papers on the science of embodiment, what's called interoception. And, and two things that really stuck out for me, I want to share before we meditate, because I think it it invites us a different kind of inquiry is that there are really different ways that we kind of feel the sense of emotions in our body and that we can really start to develop an ability to notice when we're actually kind of predicting what will happen next. And when we're also kind of, you know, an amalgamation or simulating what's happening. So for example, um, this imagining what we will feel next right kind of imagining our experience um a lot of the ways that our body is interacting with the world is actually it's not us noticing what's happening it's us kind of imagining so for example if you're walking on the sidewalk and then it ends and you're going to walk on dirt before you walk on the dirt you already have a sense of what that will feel like under your feet you make these micro adjustments so oh that's going to be less stable right and when we think of that kind of predictive modeling, we even do that for our own experiences in our body, right? And so there's a lot of our conscious awareness of our body that is happening and we're not noticing. So we meditate, we get a sense to like really kind of tune in a little bit to that experience. And we can also notice the interpretations we make. So we might notice that there's a lot of energy in the body. Maybe it feels kind of fast and we could call that internally, oh, I'm really anxious, but we could also call that I'm really inspired, right? So we can see that difference between our direct experience of like the phenomenal world and then a lot of our interpretations. And so in this practice, the invitation is going to be as much as possible to really kind of as just get that fine-grained sense of what's happening in the body, the level of our form body, and what's happening in the body at the level of the subtle body, without a story, without a prediction, without an elaboration. So that is what we are going to get started with here. So please find a posture that can support you for our practice together. <clears throat> For those of us who've already had a long day, you know, really finding a posture that can invite that upright spine. And if it feels comfortable to close your eyes, allowing them to be gently closed.
really considering what your body might need in order to feel that sense of a brightness and presence and ease. Maybe making some micro adjustments of where the hands are placed in the lap. Maybe trying out and noticing if the head wants to rest a little farther forward by dipping the chin down, or maybe tilting the head back from side to side, really finding a place the head feels evenly balanced on top of the neck. And as we become aware of our body, we can notice that our body is in a specific space for those of us in the center right here on 24th Street. And for our friends at home, noticing what the space is like immediately around you having a sense of your location. And then connecting to the space outside of the room that we're in, the darkness of the sky, And then with this bell, officially beginning our practice, really tune in to the sound of the bell and how it's experienced in the body. To get us started in this experience of being in the form body, we'll walk through a gentle body scan as though we were pouring all of our attention and awareness into the body bit by bit, beginning by simply noticing the sensations that can be sensed at the top of the head. And then noticing around the back of the head where the head meets the neck. So gentle this noticing or the scanning. We're not exerting to make something happen that isn't there. but we are engaging with this gentleness and curiosity 
this part of our body we may not usually attend to, giving this gift of our kind and curious attention just a bit longer in the back of the head. And drawing our attention now to the face, such a rich area of sensation, giving ourselves plenty of time here. As though we could fill all the tiny little cells with this kind and curious attention, noticing bit by bit by bit. And as much as possible, doing so in that way of just pure experiencing. So if there's heaviness around the eyes, letting it be heaviness. Noticing if there's a thought or judgment around it. I'm tired or it hurts. Instead, really be curious. What is the quality of tired or the quality of ache? For a couple breaths, feel the whole head, top of the head and the back, the face and the experience of this entire unified field. Inviting our attention and awareness now to include the throat and the clavicle. Noticing the top area of the chest and around the shoulders. And continuing to notice the upper back and shoulder blades. As much as possible, inviting a sense of wonder and awe. Just this incredible human body. All its capacity of sensing. bringing the attention <clears throat> the attention down through the lower back sacrum
And infusing our attention and awareness to the right shoulder, bicep, elbow, forearm, through the top of the hand, the palm, the fingers and fingertips. Notice if you're creating an image of your arm or your hand in your mind. As much as possible, feel the hand and the arm from within the hand and arm. Moving over to the left side, bringing our attention and awareness to the left shoulder, bicep, the elbow and the forearm, the top of the hand, the palm, the fingers, the tips of the fingers. Continuing through the front of the body, over the chest and the rib cage, around the belly, we experience so much of our emotions through the chest and belly. It's giving ourselves some extra time to just notice these areas at the level of the form body. And feeling this unified experience of sensation through the entire upper body, torso, arms, and head. No problem if you get distracted at any point. Just relax and release and return. Maybe even with a sense of rejoicing to being in union with our attention to the body. And then extending our attention and awareness through the buttocks and the right thigh, kneecap, the shin, the calf, the ankle and top of the foot and the sole of the foot, and our toes, 
on the very tips of our toes. And our left thigh, kneecap, our shin, calf, top of the foot, sole of the foot, and toes. And feeling this incredible unified presence of being in this body. So many sensational pieces, parts. So much movement. And yet we can still find the stillness in the posture. Stillness of noticing. And gently slowing our next breath and feeling as though we are drawing it in from the soles of the feet all the way to the top of the head. And then exhaling from the top of the head back down to the soles of the feet. And repeating that a couple times, unifying our breath and our awareness of the body. And then we'll shift our attention and focus from the form body to the subtle body. And to aid us in doing so, we'll, we'll bring forth a memory, something that can help us experience a bit of the emotional residue that can be experienced through the subtle body. So consider bringing to mind a time when recently you felt maybe a little lonely or uncertain. This doesn't have to be a huge experience. It could be a simple feeling, waking up, maybe sometime in the evening. Maybe a sense of worry if loneliness doesn't come to mind easily. And without getting engaged and energizing, the contents of this feeling. See if you can recall what it was like at an embodied level to feel a sense of loneliness or worry. For many of us, this may quickly usher in a whole cascade of different sensations in the body. And for others, this may not be quite so strong. Whatever you may notice from 
evoking and bringing forth this memory of loneliness or worry. Just bring your full attention and awareness to any shifts and changes in the body, in the subtle body where there is that bridge of our mind and physical experience. Again, gentle curiosity with the sensations. Notice if the mind wants to hold on to the story and keep refocusing and dropping the attention just into what can be sensed in the body. Feeling or imagining as though whatever sensations in the body are associated with this are perfectly fine, have all the space they need. And seeing if you can relax into the experience of the subtle body and this emotional residue. making it not a problem. And then gently shifting, not as a way to deny or avoid this felt embodied experience, but to shift to another way of experiencing. It's possible to consider something in which you recently felt deep appreciation or gratitude. Maybe the beauty of the sky today. Maybe the smiling face of a friend, maybe a memory, some joyful experience. Take a moment, bring something to mind, and again, focus not only on the memory and its contents, but the feeling in the body, the feeling in the body. Noticing the differences of these sensations.
Mm, for a couple breaths. Seeing if it's possible to just rest in everything that's being experienced in the body. The residue of loneliness, of gratitude, of all the felt sensations from the top of the head to the tips of the toes, subtle energies, movements. It's fully present in the body. Thank you for your practice. See if you can stay in your body, even as we transition to our dominant sense, seeing, hearing. I haven't let a body scan in a really long time. That was nice. Curious for folks, anything you noticed? Maybe the progression from the foreign body to the subtle body? Anything familiar? Yeah, and yes. Yes, please, thank you. I like your sweater. Hello? You can hear me? Okay. Can you all hear? Can you hear me? Can someone give a thumbs up? Yes. Thanks. <laughs> yes. No, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, I. So that was a beautiful body scan. Um, all the time that we spent up here was really helpful. Mm. You know, we really, it was uh, thorough. And when we made the switch from form to subtle, and, and this is something I've, I've realized and, and, and found before, but I was experiencing it in, in the moment and just wanted to share that, 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 that the the getting in touch with the the loneliness the um, the feelings the energy the subtle changes the um, the 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 flow of energy and the, the just the, the the feelings that were coming over me um I'm not always good at doing this, but I was, you know, you, you're a fantastic guide. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so, um, uh, not attaching, you know, thoughts and clinging and aversion to what's going on, um, minus the thoughts or clinging or aversion to these feelings, they, although there was a lot of variation they weren't very different in nature. Yes. Great. Right. Yeah. The joy of seeing somebody, right. That, that I love, uh, the loneliness of, you know, being signal and finding myself alone a lot, you know, those, those feelings are, um, just different levels of intensity and sensation. 
Beautiful. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Beautiful. Yeah. That's amazing to hear that description. And I think really hard to get ahead of our preference. It's, you know, cause it's like, oh, but no, but that one feels good. Right. But does it, you know, and, and it does. Right. And yet I think we make even a bigger story. It, it's undeniable that there are, you know, these psychological experiences associated with emotion but we we really hang in there right our our kind of desire to um kind of keep it going can be really strong and and especially with loneliness you know there is it's beautiful it's it's a natural human emotion right and not pushing it and kind of ex expecting you know it to be different or a certain way it's a lot like you know when we do the we did the mindfulness of phenomena last week and when we hear different sounds off like oh, I don't like that sound like, mm, just a different tempo or rhythm or vo like, what is it that you don't like right um, thank you so much yeah anybody else any reflections questions insights yes I think I see something online too after. Hey, uh, so at some point I shifted over into a feeling of real like expansiveness. Mm. Uh, like yes. Vantage point really shifted for me. It reminded me of some fevers I'd had mm. when I was really young. And so I started to feel kind of uh, scared of that. Mm. <clears throat> I, I'm not exactly sure what's going on in that process, but it just reminded me of these states that felt really negative when I was younger. Hmm. Interesting. And that was when the expansion was happening? Yeah, just the, the vantage point really shifts um, way farther back. Hmm. Yes. More open field. Yeah. And then suddenly that brought up these memories. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure I can... Um speak to the memories, but it, there might be an association. The subtle body isn't in the body. And often when we do subtle body practices, we, we feel bigger, right? There is a, like a energy field, sorry, that's the scientist in me, energy field going larger, right? Um, and it's whether or not, well, it's arguable whether or not we can measure that at this point, there's different scientific point of views, First person introspection, can we feel it? I certainly feel it. You know, I, I know that there's a sense of expansion. Sometimes people call it a dissolving when it becomes even more potent. And the subtle body has that, um, that contour or lack of contour. So maybe there's an interesting, maybe something that was a little more threatening with the fever state when you were young, which could have... I've never thought about fever as an altered state of consciousness, but it is. So anyway, so I don't know, but thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Do I see something from our online friends? Yes. Hi. Um, hi, Diane. Just wrote in the chat, thank you very much, Eve. This felt like gentle radiance, even when touching loneliness. Denise put mm. that in the chat. Oh, thank you. Simple radiance, even when touching loneliness. Yeah. Hmm. Wonderful. Anybody else questions or thoughts in that practice? Yes. I thought it was really interesting when you evoked um, or you asked us to bring up a, a feeling of loneliness and and to remember a time when we felt that. And so I did, you know, I, you know, I pulled up a time, but then I took just the feeling and removed the time or removed the context. And it was really interesting how, going back to the gentleman over here said that, how that, you know, when you just sit with it and observe it and you take away the context or the event, it just becomes a beautiful emotion. Yeah. So that was really interesting. Mm. So beautiful. Thank you. 
Yeah. And, you know, I, I really think it's such a powerful experience too, for us to see that shift, right? A lot of the times when we are working with our difficult to feel emotions, our strategy is like, let's think our way through this or let's distract or like anything, but feel it. And then we feel it and it's like, oh, okay. Right. And, but it's so hard. And that's why we use meditation, right. As our training ground so that slowly we maybe can start to um, apply this when we're feeling that. You know, I, I don't know about you all, but the loneliness feeling was recent in the last couple of days. And how do we bring that, you know, that let me meet this, let me just be with this sensation and not the story. So helpful and such a profound practice, right? We're kind of cutting through um, a habit, a delusion that our feelings are everything. If I feel lonely now, I am lonely, as opposed to this is a feeling of loneliness. So thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. Oh, Claudia, please. Is there a difference between this um, that you asked us to be in touch with our subtle body and shaking hands? with emotions is it pretty much question yeah um there's really no difference this is the handshake practice by Sokni Rinpoche um except that for him he often he a doesn't usually ask us to bring to mind an emotion but to just use what's in our body mm -hmm. I love that but it's sometimes a little more vague um to get a, a feeling for and his instruction, we would probably stay with just one of those emotions. And I thought it would be interesting for us to, you know, really invite in almost more than one and then sit with both. Um, but very much that same approach, which he really invites us to do of letting go of all the associations and the story and really deepening into the body. And that is absolutely in core teachings. Um, of Buddhism, but his his specific highlighting of it, especially as a, of a technique for us to be able to settle into practice, is, is unique. Thank you. Okay, story time. That's what this book feels like. like yay! Into the great stories. So, as I mentioned, <clears throat> there's actually I don't I don't want to leave out anything. So there's. Um, a very short chapter, chapter five, that is almost like it's a, a glimpse of what we'll learn more about. And it's called a bowl of milk. And um, this is when um, <laughs> the narrative structure of this book is very interesting. It goes from Buddha at every age in life, and then Buddha young, Buddha old, Buddha, Buddha middle-aged. And so it can be a little bit... Um, jarring but this is buddha right before he woke up like so he's under the papala tree by the river um, and this is him right when he is leaving the phase of his practice of the greatest um kind of aestheticism when he had literally given up on almost all food except for the tiniest amount almost all water and that he believed at that time, as did many spiritual seekers, that was the true path. It's this real asceticism. And in this, um, in this chapter, it talks about Sujata, who's one of the young children of his first, who are his first disciples in the forest. And she encountered the Buddha as he was in this realization in the forest of, I can't keep abusing my body. I actually, that's too much. I, I live in this body. I thought it was a nice uh, tie in with our body practice. And he's going to the village to seek sustenance. And um, says, as Sujata neared the river, she saw a man lying unconscious on the road. 
She put down her platter and ran to him. He was barely breathing. His eyes were tightly closed. His cheeks had a sunken look of someone who had not had food for a long time. From his long hair and tangled beard and ragged garment, Sujata knew he was a mountain ascetic who must have fainted from hunger. Without hesitating, she poured a cup of milk and eased it against the man's lips, spilling a few drops on them. At first, he did not respond, but then his lips quivered and parted slightly, and she poured milk into his mouth. He began to drink, and before long, the cup was empty. He said, I've been practicing meditation in the mountains. Harsh ascetic discipline has left my body so weak. So today I decided to walk down to the village to beg for food, but lost all my strength. Thanks to you, my life has been saved. And um, he said, I have seen that abusing the body cannot help one find peace or understanding. The body is not just an instrument. It's the temple of the spirit the raft by which we cross to the other shore. I will no longer pra practice self-mortification. I, I will go into the morning, into the village each morning and beg for food. And, you know, just this, it's interesting to think of the many views that we hold of our body on our spiritual journey and practice. You know, I think it, we can do pretty intense pendulum swings and we can think, oh, you know, spending time thinking about your body, it's just so egocentric. Like, I don't need to go to the CrossFit gym. I'm just going to sit and meditate, right? <clears throat> and that's not necessarily right or wrong. But like, how do we get into this, what then Buddha discovers, the middle way of really honoring the body? Like, we can't only just focus on our practice and hope that our body will sustain us. Like, we have to have movement, and nourishment. There has to be, like, a real reverence for the body, but not a not an egoic attachment. It's such a subtle um, difference and shift. And it's interesting, um, you know, in a later chapter, he'll get in a lot further to how he had came to that realization that it just is not um, possible to wake up without the body. And yet many of the practices I think we encounter, some of us at least, and along our way, are really focused on, on the mind as though it were separate from the body. You know, like we're training our mind. And yet maybe needless to say, um, the mind has a vehicle it moves around in right and and actually that interesting in that scientific article I was citing earlier such a beautiful uh, way of looking at knowing you know a knowing that our, our mind is sending signals so so called to the body and the body sending signals to the mind and it's bi-directional right and that if we're going to wake up in our body it has to be the entire body that's waking up not the mind telling the body to wake up. Um, so I just thought that was a really, it's like a two-page chapter, um, but a very sweet um, little reminder and kind of one of the many ways in this story that really honoring and inhabiting the body um, is woven in. And after the Buddha is nourished with this wonderful milk, he decides to tell the children the story of his life. So we move into this next chapter. Yay. Um, <clears throat> and so this is the story um, of the rose apple tree. Are folks familiar with this story? Heard this before? It's it's one that's um, somewhat often cited by teachers. It's 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 quite a beautiful, um, quite a beautiful story. Let's see here. So, yeah, um, there was a big harvest festival, and sorry, not harvest, it was like the first plowing of the year, um, and it was when Siddhartha was nine years old, and he was allowed to kind of be invited to this festival, which was pretty rare. Most often, he was kept inside the palace walls, and I think as maybe all of us know, there was this prince, right? The highest level um, 
in the society at that time, just this beloved son of a very powerful king. Um, and one day when he was nine years old, Siddhartha and his schoolmates were allowed to tend the ritual first plowing of the fields. His mother dressed, or his stepmother, um, I should probably tell that story, but I'll get back to it. His stepmother dressed Siddhartha right down to the fine slippers on his feet, attired in his royal best. Um, he and the king and the holy men and the Brahmins paraded in robes and, and headdresses of every color imaginable. The ceremony was held next to the finest fields in the kingdom, not far from the palace itself. Flags and banners waved from every gate along every roadside. Colorful displays of food and drink were laid out on altars covering along the roads, crowded along the roads. Minstrels and musicians strolled among the throngs of people, adding to the mirth and merriment, uh, to the bustling festivities. Holy men chanted with utmost solemnity, and Siddhartha's father and all the dignitaries of the court stood facing the unfolding ritual. So you get a kind of feel, right? This big celebration and ceremony. And what's really interesting is he, Thich Nhat Hanh, uses this as a opportunity to really start talking about um, the inequality in the society at that time. Mm -hmm. And the inequality in the society at that time, as I mentioned in the beginning of our evening, is a huge part of Siddhartha waking up. And so um, he asks his mom, stepmom, why is the ceremony so long? And why must the holy men chant so long? And she says, they're reciting the Vedas, my child. The scriptures have a profound meaning handed down by the creator himself to the Brahmins countless generations ago. You will study them soon. He asks, why doesn't father recite them instead of having the Brahmins do it? She says, only those born into the Brahma caste are permitted to recite the scriptures. Even kings who wield great power must depend on the services of the Brahmins for priestly duties. And in the next chapter, and I'll just read this ahead, you see that um, there's a real, in some ways, like monopoly on anything spiritual happening um, that would be presided over by the Brahmin caste. So you have the kings, but even the kings need to bring the Brahmins in. But it's not only at that high caste or level. So a little bit later in Siddhartha's life, a couple of years later, it says one day as he was passing a straw hut, he was startled by mournful cries from within. He asked his cousin to enter and inquire about it and learned that the head of the household had recently died. The family was wretchedly poor. The wife and children were piteously thin and dressed in tattered rags. The house was on the verge of collapse and Siddhartha learned that the husband had desired the services of a Brahmin to purify the earth before rebuilding their kitchen. But before, before providing the services, the Brahmin demanded the man work for him. Throughout the several days, the Brahmin had ordered him to haul large rocks and chop wood. During the time, the man became ill, and the Brahmin permitted him to return home. But halfway home, he collapsed on the road and died. And that story really moved um, Siddhartha of like, why are we engaged in, you know, these, these rituals and these um, expectations and these kind of roles that are clearly harmful? And we'll see a little bit later when he starts studying the Vedas on his own and all of these scriptures, he realizes there's no reason that this one group of people are the only group of people who could wield this power. And that is a really important um, like insight for him. They were, the, it says, the Brahmins are the sole ones regarded as capable of understanding the hidden mysteries of heaven and earth. They alone could use prayer and ritual to bring proper order to the realms of humans and the natural world. So it's real setup that, you know, without their blessings, nothing could happen. And yet the blessings came at a very high cost, whether you were rich or poor. Um, and then this, <clears throat> this gets into this little experience that Siddhartha has amid this huge, amazing festival. I kind of think of it as like outer lands. I don't know. I don't have an idea without the plowing of the field, right? Lots of joy and merriment and music. Um, but he's, he's really, he's, he's tired. It's a hot day in the festival and he, 
He goes to watch and what he sees is uh, a water buffalo straining to pull a heavy plow, followed by a robust farmer whose skin was bronzed from long work in the sun. The farmer's left hand steadied the plow while his right hand wielded a whip to urge the buffalo. The sun blazed on the man's sweat, poured down in, it poured down in streams from his body. The rich earth was divided into two neat furrows. As the plow turned the earth, Siddhartha noticed that the bodies of worms and other small creatures were being cut as well. Mm. As the worms writhed upon the ground, they were spotted by birds who flew down and grabbed them in their beaks. Then Siddhartha saw a larger bird swoop down and grasp the smaller bird in its talons. Utterly absorbed in these events, standing beneath the burning sun, he also became drenched in sweat and ran to the shade of the rose apple tree. He had just witnessed so many things strange and unknown to him. He sat cross-legged and closed his eyes to reflect on all he had seen. And so it's seeing this ritual that's supposed to be one that's so joyous and amazing, so kind of imbued with all these blessings. And he saw, wow, this, this like buffalo is straining, this farmer is straining. And as you're cutting the earth, you know, you're cutting through these little worms. Um, and again, he's just nine years old, but he kind of naturally finds himself in repose. And I don't know about you all. I can't quite remember nine, but I think I had a lot of clear seeing. I think that's a time when we're aware enough, you know, that maybe the story about reality that had been shared to us, we're like, huh, but why is this like that? Like, wait, this seems, this doesn't seem like, are the adults really adulting here? Like who's in charge? Um, and so there he is trying to reflect on this kind of disconnect of a festival that's to be so joyous. And then his, he's sitting beneath the tree and um, his mom comes up to him and he says, mother, reciting the scriptures does nothing to help the worms and the birds. Mm -hmm. And it's just this, um, Siddhartha stood up and ran and clasped her hand. Um, and yeah, it was just like that moment. And he kind of refers back to it. And there's a big theme again of him sitting under these trees, having insights. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, another one coming ahead, but just this real um, sense of like through observing life and what he's seeing, he starts to see mm -hmm what's being offered is just not um, not just, not fair, and not making people happy. That's kind of an early insight. So yeah, I'd be curious, there's a little bit more in this chapter, but I'd be curious from folks, any questions on that or any kind of, do you remember any of those insights when you were young, like seeing things and being like, wait, like, why? And for many of us, those just kind of get like pushed away, right? As we grow older and supposedly know better. And I think as we progress on our path of waking up, we kind of recapture that wonder of like, why are we doing it this way? Is there a different way to see things or a different way um, yeah, to create the conditions and the causes that allow us to wake up. And in some ways it is a questioning. It can't, <clears throat> it can't just be accepting everything as it is and trying to wake up. Yes. Yeah. Um, what grade are you in when you're nine? Fourth grade. coming with a story. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just waiting here. Oh. 
<clears throat> so when I, I actually, two things came to mind was the bake sale, um, which is that ever since I was a tiny kid, I was like very concerned about what was going on with the earth. And so I would do a little bake sale in front of Safeway for oh. to save the whales and dolphins. And I'm 53. So we're, this <laughs> isn't like, you know, four years ago. Um, so that's just, you know, one way I was like, this is insane. Like we're killing these beautiful creatures, mm. ruining their home. And then from the age of seven, um, I begged my mother to divorce my father. Mm. And I loved my, I mean, my dad was complicated, but it was like very clear that it was a, not a good relationship to stay in. And I don't know very many seven-year-olds that are like, I think maybe you should get divorced. <laughs> And I'd be like, oh, you should get divorced. You should get divorced. You should get divorced. And then I would also write on her cigarettes. Please don't smoke me and draw little frowny faces. And I love my mommy. So I think there was some time, there was some clarity when I was younger. Mm. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. I'm glad Dave. you were forced. I remember definitely here, I grew up in the city, probably around nine, but maybe even earlier of like, wait, why are, why are we okay with so many people who are unsheltered? And just that being um, like very concerning. I, I didn't have a rose apple tree um, to sit under. And I, but I do think it, it, in a good way, it really planted a seed of not necessarily trusting that everything was figured out already. Um, and I do think it's hard, especially, you know, Siddhartha and, and for many of us, when we have privilege to question, wait, is this privilege, like, is everything okay in a system that actually benefits me? Um, which is, again, just a, such a strong part of the Buddha's journey that I don't always hear about. Um, how, how important that was for him in the context of his uh, waking up. Any other thoughts or reflections? Yeah. You know, just hearing that story for the first time, it's, it, you know, that story can apply today. You know, when we step out our, like you said, we step out of our doors and you see people are just like, you know, I guess, you know, needed to run the machine, you can call it. Yeah. And, and you know, most of us think it's okay. Yeah. You know, and then it's interesting because like, as a little kid, I was the same way. And I think as a little kid, you, it's acceptable to, to say things because you say it with, uh, you see things with truth. You know, you just see it, you see it and say it as things are. And then as we grow up, you know, your parents really quickly tell you it's not appropriate to, you know, mom, what is that guy's breath smell? You know, you can't, you can't say that to him. <laughs> you know? And so as adults, it's not appropriate to, to a lot of times speak truthfully it's because, you know, you don't want to offend someone or you don't yeah. want to hurt someone. Mm -hmm. So we just kind of like, you know, little kids can say, but we can't. So yeah. I think it's fascinating that, that that story can, you know, you can, especially in this city can still hold true. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I think that, you know, we're kind of brought in from our more truth seeing. And then for some of us too, I think as adults, it's like, well, we could say the truth without getting in trouble, but it might break our hearts even greater, right? We feel like I can't do anything. So why should I say anything? And as we'll get into these chapters, you hear Buddha over and over saying there has to be a way to kind of transform our minds and hearts and bodies in order to avoid the suffering of, um, you know, sickness, old age, dying. And it's interesting to think that the way that he is approaching it entirely, his, um, in one chapter ahead, his his wife, his soon to be wife, goes to the villages every weekend and tries to, you know, offer medical supply to those who have who are less fortunate. She's also a princess, of course, and she hopes that her example will help. 
right? And I think for, I know many folks um, in this room, you know, being an example, offering service, that's like one way. But if we don't do that with a transformed mind, that like that will lead to burnout, right? I, I look at the description of Buddha's wife. I was like, oh, she got burnt out. You know, she was just offering and offering. And even though she had limitless resources, right? She went home to the palace, right? And it was of no consequence to her to give everything she could give, but to give and give and not be able to truly address like the ultimate source of suffering will cause burnout. And yeah. You can give and give, but if people don't want to receive, that can definitely lead to burnout. Yes. You know? Yes. And In this uh, case, they were receiving, but absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I lately have experienced that with my own family. And it's just really interesting how, you know, sometimes no matter what you say, it's just like if people are not receptive to it or in the right mind space, it's just like eventually you're going to get burned out. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, you know, the, the training of really like developing, you know, again, just like back to our practice, like just being able to feel the sensations of emotion as sensations. It's like one little part of all the little pieces of transformation needed so that we can kind of meet and face and work with the realities of this world. And not that we transform our mind, heart, and body, and then we can just kind of hang back but so that we can like lean in but family is like the last level before enlightenment <laughs> just for the record <laughs> like don't not maybe not this lifetime so yeah i see your hand i'm a little confused and i'm trying to understand how these different pieces come together. So there's what we did in the meditation about understanding, you know, just sensations and being in our body and embodiment. Yeah. And we're talking about waking up to suffering and the burnout. So I, I'm not clear on what what is the what is the opposite of giving without burning out. Yeah. And you said something about without addressing the ultimate source of suffering. What does that mean? Yeah, yeah. So I think that idea of if we are engaging with whatever experience it is, our, our distress, our worry, our, our frustration, um, if we're like really kind of adding extra to it, so we feel it, right? We, for, we'll use a simple example. You walk, we, many of us will walk out here and see someone who's suffering on the street tonight. Um, the ultimate source of suffering according right to the to this buddhist approach isn't just that you know there is sickness old age and dying it's the way that we approach sickness old age and dying it's how we can't meet it how we like go extra on it i think there's another layer and level two where if we aren't so caught up in self-preservation like the fear of like i don't want to um you know, like you, you'll hear a lot in this chapter, even about how worried the king is about his own kingdom, right? And that as a result makes him hold what he wants tighter. He doesn't have the freedom from his difficult emotions. Even though he has all this resource, he's still stuck in worrying that someone else is going to go after what he has. It's like the ultimate freedom is in freedom from the conditions of life, which are always going to happen, right? We can't there's no immortality. There's no way to avoid sickness, old age, and dying. But there is a way to like meet it with more openness, meet it with more compassion. So then, are you saying that by just trying to give and give and give, that like you're, you know, by say this this princess that was trying to fix this problem that she couldn't solve right. necessarily. Yeah, she was contributing, but she couldn't solve it. And that that sort of um, endless that 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 is like a a source of conflict right there that she couldn't resolve. Not that she couldn't resolve the suffering, but that she couldn't meet the fact that she can't resolve the suffering. So, like, spoiler alert: when she becomes a nun, right, way later, 
she's still offering herself and her services to help others like completely dedicated but in addition to like giving you know um ointments for wounds she would be training you know these folks who are distressed in how to calm their mind <clears throat> and how to calm their heart because even if their wounds are are addressed <clears throat> those kind of difficulty of all of the stickiness of our emotion, all of the delusion, all the craving, all the grasping will still follow us. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate like kind of weaving them together because it's interesting in this story, like every little piece of the teaching shows up just a little bit, you know, and then by about halfway through, he literally is just giving you the four foundations of mindfulness. And it's like really clear what the teaching is. But in these first stories, um, there it's like a bit more subtle. And even this, you know, him highlighting, um, reciting the scriptures does nothing to help the worms and birds. Like it's just putting down this first little breadcrumb where we start to see the evolution of his consciousness towards this true liberation, right? From those habits and patterns so thanks yes thank you um i was having two thoughts one of them is that i think the thing about nine-year-olds is that it's kind of um somebody's watch here hmm. is uh it's sort of like just before puberty mm -hmm. and there's this whole body thing that happens at that point. So there's just, I'm just interested. We're talking about embodying things. Mm. I think nine-year-old bodies are really different than 13 or 14 year old. And there's something about that energy of mm. sexuality that, that mm. kind of, I don't know what it does, it, but it's certainly not clear thinking, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Not clear thinking is sort of more about grasping or hunger or whatever. Right. So, yeah. So I, that's an interesting part about the nine-year-old and then i also just can't help but think that it's not a coincidence that it's a girl who comes to him and, and mm. um, gives him milk of course but but just that it feels like there's something i guess i i'm listening to a lot of stories nowadays and, and hearing kind of gender mm. as part of the dynamic of it and mm. i'm wondering about the you know the the festival and the plowing it all seems very testosterone-y <laughs> in a certain way and, Oh, and then yeah. this moment of nurturing that comes from, you know, this young girl. Yeah. And I just, so I'm always, I mean, so I'm really, you said something about the stepmother and there's another story about his actual mother. And so I'm just sort of, yeah, as we're going through this, I'm just really trying to hear, or yeah. I just can't help myself, but hearing about that yeah. from a gender perspective and what's going on with that. Thank you for bringing that up. At, at some point I was going to have to bring up the fact that, yeah, it's, it's, you know, the patriarchy is not a recent phenomena. And unfortunately, right, it's amazing that the Buddha was open from, from day one, that anyone of any caste should be included in the Sangha, no matter what. But we got to wait for women. That's going to be hard. So truly, he waits like decades to include women. So it's, you know, it is, it's the world, right? It's it's the world. But he also, anyway, we'll we'll get into those chapters. But he is he is aware of um, the danger of of his teachings and what what the danger is, how it's experienced by all the kings and the kings in the land, and that the teachings and he's able to really live and survive on the generosity of all these villages, right? And to completely upset the order which he wants to do more than anything would threaten everyone and all the teachings. At least that's the, that's the way Thich Nhat Hanh kind of couches it. But that's according to what we know in history, it took, and it was um, his stepmother who kind of demanded ultimately. And um, yeah, no, the women, you know, the figures of the women in this book, there, there are some strong ones, but there's some very kind of, prototypical um, representations. But I do think, especially through the presence of nature, we see a lot of sacred feminine um, in this in this depiction, which I really appreciate. Um, there's so much more. Um, just because we brought it up and, and it is in this chapter, um, the Buddha's mom, 
you know, it's, it's interesting. You think about early childhood adversity and often, um, you know, that can be a source of needless to say, great pain and also um, growth. And his, his mother died when he was only eight days old and her sister came to take care of him. And in this book, at least, there's nothing about that really early loss, right? That's undeniable. And I know we've shared in, in this sangha and, in, and other sanghas I've sat in, loss is often one of our greatest dharma doors, right? We come into the practice through difficulty, not because things are awesome. <laughs> um, so it's, yeah, also his experience, even though he had this great stepmother, like he lost his mom, you know, very early. Um, and so that's, yeah, just another human factor of this beautiful teacher. Um, yeah, I just, it's, it's so, it's so rich for me. I've read this book, I think I mentioned four times. I find it really supportive, but talking about it together, it's a whole other level. So thank you for story time. And uh, yeah, let's take a minute to dedicate our practice. So let's give ourselves a couple moments to come into the body. And considering the words of the Buddha in this chapter, that this body has a, a sacred home, as the raft which gets us to the other side. And it's an instrument for all the good we can do in this world. And if it feels comfortable, this bringing hands together at the heart to connect to the motivation and intention for our coming here together. Of course, to more and more wake up to the ways we get stuck. And to further develop and generate this awakened heart this natural and beautiful aspiration that we could be of service to all beings. And considering if there's any benefit from our gathered time here tonight, we offer that. And with our entire body, consider just these beautiful phrases of offering. May all beings be healthy and strong. May all beings know belonging, safety. May all beings connect to the true causes of happiness and be free from the true causes of suffering. May we all be free. Thanks, everyone. If there's someone you've never met here and you want to say hi, that's cool. It's a nice thing to do. Hope to see you again soon. Gentle Donna reminder. Thank you.